Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for our conversation on accessibility and ADA advocacy with leaders from three Nevada performing arts venues. My name is Erica Hill. I'm the Community Arts Development Specialist in Northern Nevada, and I'll be facilitating our conversation tonight. The Nevada Arts Council is committed to making art and culture accessible across the state and finding ways to increase accessibility and awareness of accessibility. In 2019, we began the IDEAS program to lead workshops in inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. We continued these workshops online in 2021, but during the past year, as we have finally emerged from the pandemic as a fully staffed agency, we have done these workshops internally with our staff to better understand our own bias and identify where we can make ourselves more aware of our needs to address accessibility within our agency and to our constituents. We understand that the Nevada Arts Council plays a critical role in advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in and through the arts. We know we must constantly challenge ourselves to reduce barriers and bias, making the arts central to the well being and prosperity of all communities across Nevada. We are committed to advance inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility through our actions. Now we are developing programming in which we encourage conversations on these topics and facilitate opportunities to engage with these subjects. Tonight is the first program in a series in which we give platform to those with personal experiences and idea work. We recognize that tonight's panel is just the start of our conversation and programming we are developing on these topics. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce you to our speakers tonight, advocates of accessibility representing three different performing arts organizations in Nevada, Denise Sewell, Executive Director of the Pioneer Center, Melanie Jupp, Director of Education and Outreach at the Smith Center, Melissa Taylor, Executive Director of the Reno Little Theater, and Layla Learman, Chair of the Reno Little Theater's IDEA Committee. We will give each speaker 20 minutes to talk with us and follow it up with the questions and answers at the end. We will begin with Denise, followed by Melanie, and then close the night with Melissa and Layla. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Melissa Taylor. I use she, they pronouns. I am the executive director of Reno Little Theater. I'll, uh, we'll introduce ourselves in like two more slides, but before we move forward, I want to say um, thank you to the other presenters because I don't know if you noticed, but I was taking copious notes the whole time you were talking, which speaks back to what Denise and Melanie both talked about with the fact that this work is ongoing and that the best way to move forward is by working with other people. So I'm really grateful for what you both shared. I'm also excited because RLT is a very different organization than the two previous presenters. Um, we are a community theater and we have over 200 artists and volunteers that work with us. So we are not only looking at the experience of the audience, but we're looking at our program participants as well. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. How do I... I didn't even know I put transitions in there. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I've been with RLT since 2013. There's some of the information about me, but um, I work as a producer, director, administrator, actor, designer, like anything that has to happen in a theater I have done. And so I, I definitely can speak to um, doing this work from a multiple of perspectives. I brought with me um, Leela Learman, and I'll let you introduce yourself, Leela, but I wanted to just say that I'm so grateful that she was able to join um, because Leela is the co-chair of our permanent idea committee. Leela? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I've been with Reno Little Theater since 2021. Um, I went to UNR and I have a bachelor's in audiology and speech pathology and an associates in deaf studies. Um, I myself am hard of hearing and I'm also neurodivergent. Um, so disability and advocacy is something that is near and dear to my heart. And I was very honored to, um, when Melissa asked me to be a part of this. I also, during the pandemic, founded Nevada Smiles. Um, which was a company, well, I say was, I have mostly closed it because our need for masks has gone away. But communication access was tremendously limited during the pandemic for people um, like myself who rely on lip reading, as well as people on the autism spectrum who rely on things like smiling to and other facial cues to get along. Um, so I founded that company with clear masks to kind of further that work. Oh, and I work for um, Hands of Voices, which is a nonprofit nationwide, actually, that does uh, 
deaf and hard of hearing children advocacy, connecting those parents with resources specifically in Nevada. Thank you, Leela. And at any time, if you wanna add anything, please jump in, uh, cause this is work that we do together. Um, but Reno Little Theater, uh, we were founded in 1935. Our mission is to create exceptional theatrical experiences that inspire, entertain, and strengthen our community through artistic engagement and collaboration. Um, we were founded during the Little Theater Movement, and we are the longest running uh, community theater in Nevada. We're one of fewer than 50 theater companies to reach this, this uh, age, which is pretty cool. Uh, we have a dedicated staff of uh, five full-time staff members and one part-time staff member, as well as a board of about 11 folks. And I did want to just honor that these are the people that are helping uh, us move forward in the work that we're doing. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of what we do, what our programs are, um, I feel like, Denise, I feel like my my presentation is exactly lining up with what you did. I'm not surprised. Um, so we do a, a main stage season of five to six shows. It's a balanced season. We do comedy, dramas, musicals. In fact, I should warn you that there is a murder mystery rehearsing on the other side of this wall. So if you hear screams, that's what that is. Um, we do work with community artists. We are a non-equity house, although we occasionally get to work on special contract with equity actors. And these are just some photos of some of our recent shows so you get a sense of the like quality of our work. Um, these are all recent, very recent productions. And our upcoming shows are How to Survive Your Family at Christmas, Baskerville, which is the one that might be screaming behind me, Small Mouth Sounds and Susical. So I share this because um, our goal really is to create work with and for a diverse community, like a very balanced uh, season. We also have an education program that is year round. We offer camps and classes as well as offsite partnerships. Uh, we do a lot of workshops and one of my favorite programs that we have is called Teen Speak Out, which is theater for social change, which uh, is devised pieces created by teenagers. Um, themes that they've chosen in the past have been gun violence, teen suicide, quarantine identity, and we always partner with community organizations like our center, um, uh, the Eddie House, a lot of local nonprofits to ensure that we have uh, support systems in place for both the artists and the audience on stage uh, during, during this show. Uh, we also work with a ton of community partners because we were a rental house as well. Um, oh. I really did not realize that I put those in there. So these are some of the partners that we work with. And in a regular year, uh, we have about 270 days of active programming. So we're, we're pretty busy. Uh, we also partner with Ageless Repertory Theater. So we have a senior readers theater group. We partner with Latino Arte and offer Spanish and bilingual partner uh, programming including productions, but one of the most important things is that we also, with them, host community events on immigration, voting rights, health. Uh, we did some vaccination drives and things like that. Again, this is just to show you that our organization is a community theater and that community part is really important to us. We are a 128 black box theater located in the Wells Avenue district of Reno. We are fully accessible. Um, we have a classroom space, reception spaces, dressing rooms and a rehearsal hall that is separate from this building. So when we're looking at accessibility, we're looking at a multiple, you know, multiple spaces. This is our lobby, just so you can see our dressing rooms. And these pictures are actually pretty old. We, we are bringing a photographer in to get some updated photos, but these are some of the spaces so you can get a vibe. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking a lot, I think about this through the, the lens of general inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, um, because I don't think you can talk about accessibility without talking about inclusiveness, diversity, and equity. Um, RLT celebrates and uplifts diversity in our um, community, re uh, regardless of gender, age, ability. We reject racism, misogyny, classism, homophobia, ableism, sexism, ageism, religious discrimination, and other forms of hate and bigotry. You can read our full statement. It is available online. I'm not going to click on it, but it is on our website. Um, right at the very top, you can see all of the things that we are committed to in doing this work. Uh, again, we are a community organization, so we aim to tell stories with and for our entire community. Our public statement is new. 
as is our, our uh, committee, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but these priorities are not new. Um, this work is something that we've been pretty passionate about for a long time. It, but it is continuous. It is constant. I will echo what everybody said before me. There is no goalpost. There is no checklist that we can get through that will ever make us feel like we have done accessibility. Like that's not a thing. Um, we do have a standing idea committee. It was formed in 2020. It is a standing policy committee that meets monthly and reports to our board monthly. I share that because I think that is one of the most important things that we have going for us um, in terms of keeping us accountable and setting very clear goals for what we want to accomplish in like specific timeframes. So, you know, we meet and then we talk about what's next. What are we doing next? Um, it is comprised of key stakeholders, including staff, board, and community members. And it is reflective of our community. Um, the purpose of this committee is to progress inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility related issues and best practices through our organization. Um, it is responsible for acting as one of the bodies that will receive reports of any sort of policy violation. I'm a big fan of policy. Um, and for <laughs> developing, reviewing, and recommending policies and practices that uh, look at everything we do through the lens of diversity, equity, um, inclusion, and access. I did that in the wrong order. Uh, but some of those things would be uh, looking at our hiring practices, our governance, our general operations, our community engagement and partnerships, our programming and production processes and practices. Ah, Leela, do you want to say anything? I'm so, I will talk a mile a minute. And <laughs> you go right ahead. I will probably make a few notes at the very end. Perfect. Thank you. Um, some of our inclusivity efforts include name your price ticketing. We do that for every production that we have um, where people get to name their prices. We also have what I think are pretty inclusive employment practices. We have a very family-friendly work environment. My four-year-old is on the other side of this room. Uh, we have unlimited PTO, the ability to work from home, and a very flexible schedule for our staff. Those commitments, um, which came about more approved pretty recently, are not only for the staff that we currently have, but for any future staff that we wanna bring on, it's ensuring that we'll be able to bring in more diverse um, employees. Um, and we will really be a place that anybody can work. Um, we also are really focused on what stories are we telling and with whom. Um, we look for opportunities to, to, to tell stories with diverse playwrights um, and have production opportunities for a diverse array of, of performers. We're very uh, into like nothing about us without us. So when we're, when we're choosing stories that we're telling, we're making sure that we actually have people on those teams who can um, tell those stories from an authentic, a culturally authentic place. And this is um, directly in alignment with disability work as well, um, because we, we don't want to make decisions for other, you know, people without their input. Some of our accessibility efforts specifically um, include working through NAD, uh, NAC's ADA checklist. It is a great resource, <laughs> and as soon as Denise pulled it up, I was like, man, I did too, because um, it's great, and I have it on my desk, and, you know, in preparation for this, I was like, let me double check, and, uh, you know, there are still things that we need to continue to work on. We do have uh, wheelchair accessible seating, classrooms and bathrooms, our rehearsal hall, um, our accessible tickets are clearly marked and available through all methods of purchase. I'm glad you said that, Denise. That is something that is really important. Um, we have a functioning elevator for access to our upper level. We have accessible parking. We also have a lot of gender neutral spaces. Um, and again, all of our dressing rooms and bathrooms are wheelchair accessible. Uh, we also, I think a big important thing for venues is an appropriate signage and lighting and clearly marking um, entrances and exits and trip hazards, things like that, as well as accessible seating. Um, we've been upgrading our space a lot lately. And so actually we literally just had the, the venue toured on November 11th for new signage. And while we met all the standards of like what we need to have, our goal is to exceed what is acceptable. And so we're going to be adding some more signage to our venue just to be extra clear. Um, all of our meetings, this is a very easy thing that I think we can do is that all of our meetings have 
the option to attend them uh, online. So any committee meeting, any, any meeting we have at this place, it is, there's a Zoom link and an in-person option. And we always make sure that the captions are enabled. We also have printed and uh, virtual programs available for audiences. And we're currently, uh, oh, go ahead. May I just add to that Please. really quick? Please, yes. Um, just a note on the captions. I would like to remind people that captions aren't just for people who are hard of hearing. Um, anybody, frequently people who are neurodivergent, ADHD have a love, really benefit from closed captions. So that is something that um, I really like to applaud. We know little theater and encourage other people. If you can have captions in meetings, please do. Thanks, Leela. Um, we are also currently updating our website. We just are literally starting a whole new website. And at, so accessibility has been at the top of our mind um, and we're not there yet. We're, we're working on this behind the scenes like every day, but things like alternative text, translations, making sure that we have clear information about our accessibility efforts. Denise, I love your page. I was like, that's, that's exactly where we need to go. Um, we also do have written emergency evacuation procedures that all of our staff, production team, and volunteers are trained on. Um, and that's, that's a really important thing, but I, I don't know that everyone thinks about that as something that should happen, especially if you're a smaller organization. These things um, might get overlooked um, when you have a small team, but they are so essential to making sure that your audiences are safe. Um, RLT has also had several ASL interpreted performances and we continue to investigate, you know, bringing those back. We have offered open, open captioning as well. And this, I'll, I'll be very honest about some of the things that we've learned and some of the challenges that we've come across. One, ASL is not accessible to everyone. Um, so there are many people who cannot you know, understand ASL anyway. And then open captioning, we've struggled with because we produce our own work, where we can display the captions and how accurate they are. Um, the same thing with any translated subtitles, you know, it's not just clicking like Google Translate does not cut it. And so you have, you know, we are committed to going that extra step of getting translated versions of the scripts through real translators. Um, but that can be another step that you have to take that can cost money and take time to do. We are currently investigating assisted listening devices, though most of our shows are not mic'd because we are a very intimate space, but we're still looking into that and whether or not miking our shows actually would make us more accessible. We are also investigating Gallopro which I saw Denise on your radar. Um, we did meet with them recently and that system offers live closed captioning, audio description and translated subtitles and or audio dubbing for alternative language access. Here are some of the challenges that we've faced and uh, Melanie already wrote, brought one of these up, the financial implications. So we are really committed to this work. And in fact, we do have a dedicated budget line item for accessibility. And I would encourage any organization, small or large, to, to commit a certain percentage of your budget to doing this work. Um, what we've realized is that while we were contributing, you know, what we thought was a significant amount of money, it's just not ever enough. Um, so we do have to go out for different sort of funding um, opportunities and things like that. But when we we're talking about something like Gallopro, for example, it would cost us about $16,000 a year. Our budget is half a million. You know, we're a much smaller organization. So there's a real financial implication to doing that. That doesn't mean we're not going to do it. It just means it is a consideration for our actual ability to offer these services. And the other challenge that we are faced with is the impact measurement. It's really hard for us to get an understanding of how many people have actually been using the services that we offer. And then that's information that tends to be asked for, for funding purposes. Um, but we don't want to ask necessarily people to identify themselves as needing to use these services because that doesn't actually feel um, equitable. Uh, and then some of the other challenges that we face are delivery methods and or technology barriers, you know, especially for captioning. Um, there are actual, you know, 
pieces of equipment that you need to make those things happen, which have either a financial implication or have uh, a, we have a small team and someone has to learn how to do it implication. Um, also, one of the biggest challenges that we have locally that I just wanted to kind of like put out there is something that we acknowledge is that we have a real challenge with the timing and consistency for rides through RTC with our artists and patrons. And it's something that we have been uh, dreaming some big picture solutions that the arts community locally might be able to get in on together to address. We'll talk, Denise. <laughs> Um, but yeah, these are just some things that there, that's to note that we can do all the work we can internally, but we really need the support system, um, outside in our local community to help us in reaching our goals. Some of the places that we've identified, um, as areas of improvement for ourselves would be continued professional development for our, our staff and board. Um, including, you know, are there certifications that we need to have? We really are focused on improving the education program's accessibility in the next few years and, and uh, looking at classroom management tools, looking at sensory inclusive, I like that, thank you, um, programs and performances, that's on our list. Um, and again, making sure that our services are featured more prominently, not just on our website, but on everything that we are sending out to folks, um, because it is our goal to exceed and not just meet our standards. There are some opportunities that we have with RLT that I'm really proud of. Number one, we have significant board and staff buy-in. If you are running an organization or you are working at an organization with a board, please let them know how important their buy-in is to this once you have that, this work will be much smoother. It, like it really has to be a part of your organization's values that this is a priority. And I mean, from the top all the way down. Um, and I'm really grateful for that because I we have that at RLT. And as a result of that, we did establish an annual budget for accessibility efforts. It's there all the time. Um, and, I, and we are planning to at least double that budget in the upcoming year as I write the new budget. We have regular opportunities for participation in professional development opportunities, uh, especially in idea work. NAC has offered some, the city of Reno has offered some. Uh, there are a lot of great organizations outside of government entities that also offer professional development opportunities. And if you can, go to everything, whatever you can go to, um, because you'll learn something. One of the other opportunities we have is that we own our facility outright, and it is not a historic building, so we are able to make uh, needed adjustments really quickly. Um, as soon as we identify a problem, it's, there's really very few barriers other than uh, time or money to just make that change because it's our building. It's also cool uh, for us, one of the, the benefits we have is that it's a very intimate space. So we're not talking about 1,500 people. We're talking about 100, and that's a very different ballgame. What that gives us is the capacity to really connect with and assist individual patrons and build very strong relationships with our patrons and something that I love about what I get to do. Also, a uh, full-time staff helps us have that consistency because we're not having a lot of turnover in the conversations and the training that have to happen. Um, that's, you know, if you can have a dedicated staff and a dedicated person to doing this work, it's going to be easier and it's going to have a longer, I think, um, sustainable impact because you're not having to redo it over and over. I'm a big fan, like I said, of standardized procedures. So we have written policies in place for all of this work. Um, we write our goals down and we check them. It's, it's like constant self-reflection on what we're doing and where we're at. I did share some resources as well. We got that Accessibility Matters checklist, uh, the City of Reno. Also, the National Endowment for the Arts has an Office of Accessibility, and we've utilized their resource list. National Art Strategies is another really great um, program that offers a lot of peer-to-peer um, um, opportunities for discussion. And I think those are equally as important as going to something that's led by a larger agency, because when you're talking to other people who are doing this work and they've got their boots on the ground, they can relate to you and give you resources and maybe say, Hey, we've already done this. Here's what, here's what we've learned from it. And that's really helpful. And another one of my favorites is of by for all. Um, this is not just accessibility, this is about general equity, but again, that is 
it's the same work. Um, there's you can literally do a self-assessment of your organization to see, you know, if like for us, it is important that our work is by us and by our community and for our community. Are we really meeting that? Um, and they offer some great tools for that. Uh, the other thing I would say is like, just look at your neighbors and reach out to your neighbors. I have reached out to the Pioneer Center on multiple occasions because they are also doing this work. And I'm really grateful to Denise's staff for when I reached out and said, hey, what accessibility, what, um, what assisted listening devices do you guys use? They went, boop, here it is. You know, and it was a great place to start. And so I really believe that continuing to just engage in these conversations altogether is, is another key component. Um, Leela, you don't have to do my questions because I know we have our own question. Did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I just a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I want to really thank the Nevada Arts Council for putting this on because Nevada is tremendously lacking resources. And when you start to get, we are a state driven by entertainment. And so when you start to get the buy-in of entertainment across the state, that is our ability to make change. Um, and I, I would like to comment because I don't know where our viewers are in this journey. This could have been tremendously overwhelming, um, but this work is daunting. And unfortunately it will always be daunting because the more you learn, the more you find out you don't know. And I can even say that I have been part of hearing and I have had ADHD my whole life and advocating for myself and learning how to do that on a day-to-day -day basis is still daunting and I'm still learning. So keep up the good work, continue to ask questions and remember that it's never going to be perfect. I freaked out and well, an hour and a half before this and went, oh my gosh, my hearing aids are gonna die and had to time out and plug them in. And that's just how it is. And that's always how this work is going to go. But it's so important. And I just commend you all for being here and continue to just ask the questions because there aren't any wrong questions. Just ask away and you will find answers lean on each other. I think that's one other thing that we have kind of made at the center of our culture at our organization is it's okay to mess up and learn from it and move forward. We absolutely are going to fail. And so what did you learn from it? And thank you for bringing that up, Leela, because we, every day we go, we thought we knew what we were doing, but oh man, now I know more. Yeah. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you all so much. I know that we ran over. We still have quite a few participants with us though. Um, it's such an important conversation to have. And it's clear that it takes a community it takes conversations, it takes collaboration, and there's always more work to do, um, but it's important work to do. Uh, right now, I'm going to um, allow our executive director, Tony, to come on and say a few words with us. Um, and I'm also gonna allow our attendees to talk. And so, um, and then, so we will, we'll open up questions, but I want to give Tony a moment to say a few words too. And it is the theme of the night is technical difficulties. Um, uh, sorry about that, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, um, you know, Denise, uh, Melanie, Melissa, and Layla for sharing your guidance and your insight and your honesty and the challenges you face and your commitment to keep improving your accessibility work. Um, coordinating and offering professional development uh, sessions like this <clears throat> is one of our three focus areas of the Nevada Arts Council as defined by our strategic plan. And that plan also highlights that everything we do at the agency is viewed through the lens of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, and how we are centering and improving our work in these areas. And I think um, all of you stated how difficult this work is, how challenging it is, how um, you know, the, the missteps and the mistakes, but definitely be kind to yourself as you as you take this on and uh, and just work to move it forward every little bit that you can. Um, in addition to all the wonderful information that was shared by our panelists, we encourage our grantees and partners to view accessibility specifically. Accessibility is both a philosophical commitment and a business practice, making, Nevada, making Nevada's arts and cultural programs 
activities, information, and facilities usable to all people is not only the right thing to do, it opens the door to new, expanded, and sustainable audiences of participants, patrons, and advocates. So again, thank you all for your wonderful presentations, and thank you all for uh, who are on and listening for uh, being here and being willing to take on this work. We really appreciate it. All right, so I'm going to stop recording and uh, 